So thank you for all having me here. It's, um, it's a pleasure. And the organizers of this asked me specifically to not to pick a topic that is about foreign policy, international relations in Southeast Asia, which I usually do. So I decided to go as far away as I can from, from a foreign policy sort of view on things and uh, speak about a lot, right? So um, the sort of topic I picked for my talk is um, what Southeast Asia and studying Southeast Asia taught me about knowledge, the unique, and the universal. So a couple of years ago I was um, flying through Singapore Airport, Changi Airport, if some of you were lucky to be there, I mean, this is a great place to be, and I was waiting for my connection in the middle of the night and I saw the airport wake up. And for some reason it was a revelation for me because when I flew in, it was late in the night, the airport was sleeping and I was leaving at about 11 a.m. So it was bustling by that point. And I saw it fill up with people. It became more and more lively and full of happenings and events. People were uh, saying goodbye, saying hello to each other. They were rushing or waiting for their flight. And it is in that airport where you specifically feel how distinct and how special and how separate the world is Southeast Asia. People were mostly flying to and from the region, not to and from the West. And this is where you feel that, you know, it's, it's not somewhere we go, it's something that exists apart from our, our views on it, and whether we study it or we go there, we know about it or we don't. Now, I thought to myself, why is it so surprising to me? Why am I surprised by the fact that the world is full of people of other cultures and other uh, beliefs? Now, ever since Edward Said published his famous Orientalism in 1978, people in the West have become at least more aware of the fallacies that exist when we study the East, the Orient, right? The way how international politics have developed, and now I promise not to talk about politics, but I will a little bit, uh, <laughs> happened to be that the East, for us Westerners, has always been a place where we come, which we study, where we fight wars, which we rob, which we uh, enslave and oppress. And this is how we study that. We create our own images of the East, of the Orient, of Asia, we imagine these worlds, and then we study whatever we imagine. And it takes special attention to notice that those worlds may not be as the ones that we've imagined ourselves. Now, when I was a, when I was a teenager, I was a big fan of fantasy fiction. The uh, books by uh, Ronald Tolkien and Ursula Le Guin and uh, Roger Gelasi <coughs> and uh, Frank Herbert. And when I started to study Southeast Asia professionally, histories and politics, at first it reminded me of that sort of uh, age and that age of wonder when, you know, the ancient kingdoms of Bagan and Magasar and Daibir and Champ reminded me of Arrakis, Middle Earth. Everything was so special, was so exotic, was so unknown and magical. But, you know, there's a big difference because uh, the war on Arrakis between the Atreides and the Harkonnens was not real, while the war in Vietnam was very much real. And this is a big difference that we have to face when we try to deal with our own images of, our constructed images of the East and of Southeast Asia in particular. Um, this region, as any other region in the world, but this one in particular, because it is so exoticized, is not something to be seen, to be discovered by us Westerners. It's something that exists in its own right, with um, people with their own lifestyles and lives and dreams and hopes and fears and problems and issues. It's very much as we live here, but not here. We do not wait for us to be discovered by somebody. We do not wait our lives to be studied or examined or told about or written books about, right? We just live and our reality is meaningful regardless of whether somebody else 
knows about it, or whether some Westerner or non-Westerner wrote about it. And I think that th th this nexus of me being in that Singapore airport and seeing and feeling the distinctiveness of this region is what um, brought me to think about the two very dangerous illusions that Orientalism and Oriental thinking breeds. The first is the illusion of final knowledge. When you, when you study a certain world and you create an image of that world in your head, suddenly at some point it seems very easy to understand. You think that, well, I've arrived at the conclusions when you are very far from them. And the second one is, I think, even worse. It's when uh, you exoticize a region, you exoticize a country, a people, a nation, and say that, well, you know, it's all magical, mystical, esoteric, unknowable, essentially. And then you start to sell your expertise as a member of a very separate cult or sect of people who know stuff about Asia and you know, this is very mystical and magical and I'm the one who knows the answers. <laughs> and always be aware of people who, who emphasize the peculiar, the, the unique, the unknowable, the exotic about anything because that is how you hide the universal values that exist that are there. Any people, any nation, any human being, everybody wants pretty much the same set of things. They want freedom from oppression, they want uh, dignity, they want prosperity, they want um, individual autonomy, and they, wa they want purpose. And this is something that we tend to forget when we focus too much on how exotic and special the places we study are. And I think that Southeast Asia is a perfect place to study this balance between the unique and the universal. Um, it's manifest to the vitality of cultures in the face of economic global globalization. I mean, um, the anti-globalist argument goes that, you know, um, mass production, economic globalization, world trade, investment, multinational companies, they've all erased basically any sort of cultural dis distinctions. But I mean, if, even if you go to the most globalized cities of Southeast Asia, to Singapore or Kuala Lumpur, I mean, yes, there are skyscrapers and unmanned monorails and e-payment technologies we can dream of. But these places are still distinctively Malaysian or distinctively Singaporean, distinctively Southeast Asian. You feel, you can almost see the local culture kind of grow through, through the cracks in the concrete of economic globalization and westernization. So, I spent um, almost nine years of my life experiencing Southeast Asia, because I grew up in Vietnam when I was a kid, and then I spent most of my student and professional years studying this part of the world. And, I mean, I, I, I still fail to distinguish the unique from the universal in Southeast Asia. I think there is no, there's no way of saying, well, this is special, this is universal. It's almost impossible. So be very careful. And the big lesson I learned is that, you know, because something looks familiar, doesn't mean you know it. And because something looks very special, doesn't mean it's unknowable. These two contradict each other, but, you know, we're all used to be trained as, in dialectics, we should sort of try to uh, hone that in, and maybe tune into some of the um, dialectics that we used to be taught in universities like this. So, um, take your time when you're approaching Southeast Asia, when you're reading about Southeast Asia, take your time, be very attentive to detail, and approach it with an open heart and an open mind. And I think this way you will be, you'll find that this is an extremely interesting region to study, and even a more amazing place to live in. Thank you very much.